I'm Ari Gronich, and this is Create a New Tomorrow Podcast. Welcome to another episode of Create a New Tomorrow. I'm your host, Ari Gronich, and I am here with a legend, and it's not Joshua Self. It is. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. Oh, that's right. <laughs> it's Forbes Riley, and Forbes has known as the billion dollar woman. She has been on HSN. She's been in movies. She's been in TV. But here's the the kicker, and the reason why I wanted to talk to her is. This woman has become a master of self-improvement and the human condition and the pitch, which to me is kind of like a, a way of talking to a person's soul so that they understand what you're saying and want what you have. So Forbes, let me... Ooh, you. That's a, that's, a very, that's a very lovely way to say it, a way of talking to somebody's soul so they want what you have. I may have to use that. You know, I, I learned something here and there from you. So Forbes, why don't you tell a little bit about your history and what made you become this, you know, to me, a master of the human condition? Well, I hope you have like four and a half hours to do this. Uh, so <laughs> I'll tell you what, one of the things that makes you who you are is that you get an understanding that life happens for you, not to you. Uh, we've all been through a lot of ups and a lot of downs. And if you haven't, shame on you. If you haven't really experienced some very high highs, which seem to also have some very low lows, you're not living the best of life. I've talked to a lot of people who just it's kind of an average road. You're like going along going, that's not what life's supposed to be. So for me, I started out as a little girl, Long Island, talking like this, uh, two loving parents. And I will tell you, I think that is my ace in the hole. If you have two loving parents, you have a step up above almost everyone else. So many people I talk to and coach have had a parent who is narcissistic or verbally abusive or physically abusive or not there. And that definitely sets you on a path because the, all the training that I've done in studying, and I've been studying the brain for almost three decades that you develop neural pathways of behaviors. If you've ever done a behavior, like why do I keep doing that? Why do I keep saying that? Or I want something, but something says I can't have it. All those are actually fixable things in your brain because your brain is nothing more than signals that connect and they're roadways. And it's interesting, you know, if you've had an abusive father, you hear the word Father's Day, your signals go to, oh, I feel bad right now. Well, that's not a real thing. You don't need to feel bad. We can actually rewire your brain when it hears father to go in a different direction. So for everybody listening, there is hope no matter where you are in life. And I've proven that over and over again. So I am, when I was little, about eight years old, I had a baseball bat hit my nose and my nose grew very crooked off the side of my face. And I ended up being a very ugly, awkward little girl. I had braces for eight years of my life. From that time I was little eight to 16 full railroad tracks, Uh, which also, you know, if you're not smiling as a kid, that's not so cool. I had very frizzy hair, grew up on Long Island and my mom was 260 pounds, fast food had just hit my town when I was born. And that's what we had because we have a whole lot of money. And so I was chunky or chubby or zoftic or whatever word the little girls like to bully me with. And the other side of that is that I was really smart, like, weirdly smart, like smart enough to sit in the principal's office and do linguistics in second grade, build a computer when I was in fourth grade. I'm eight years old, standing up in front of my class, talking about how a schematic and magnetic relays work in a silicon strip to turn these. You're like, whoa, what's wrong with this kid? And so the thing for me is it didn't make for very good friendships. I was a very lonely little girl. And that was okay because my best friend was my dog, Snoopy, and my television. And I watched a lot of television and movies and I dreamed a lot. I didn't know I was doing that at the time, but I can tell you trivia on every show from I Dream of Genie to Monkeys, Partridge Family, F Troop, The Munsters, you name it, I knew it because there was no DVR back then. I watched all that live. And I developed this sense of what else is out there beyond the tiny little house that I grew up in. And I was embarrassed. I, even if I had friends, I would never invite anyone over to my house. You know, we had plastic on the couches and we were just a kind of an odd, goofy family. We had CB radios. My dad did magic and he was an inventor. And I swear it was a very unusual childhood that I wouldn't change for anything in the world, which is kind of ironic, right? It makes me very unique, different. I think differently from everyone else I've ever talked to. And now I know why. That's how I was raised. And so uh, one of the things that I wanted to be, and one of the things that I stress to all my listeners is you have to know what you want. Life just doesn't kind of happen. 
You decide I want something and then you actually create a path to go and get it. And there's a system for that so that you can get anything. And I'm going to say anything that you want. And, you know, it's funny. So we talk about not having dads. Well, two of our presidents didn't have dads. Bill Clinton and uh, Obama did not have a dad. So it's interesting how they grew up with this want, this need to succeed. So we all have this path that we can or could be on. But so often, shame on you, most of you listen to your friends. Oh, who do you think you are to get that? Oh, yeah, you think you're all that in a bag of chips? I mean, or I can't do that. You can't. Let me tell you something. I didn't have those voices in my head. I had my two parents who were like, guess you could be anything you want to be. And I wanted to be James Bond when I was little. So what does that mean? That means I wanted to snow ski and water ski and have one of those little jet things that powers through the water. And I wanted to wear fancy clothes and, and be a spy. Well, I will tell you, that little need for that actually materialized in my 20s. I developed a company called Strippergram. And I got to punk people and literally kind of pretend I was a spy, pretend I was somebody else. And it made me a ton of money. And it was an interesting, but that's why, what I wanted to do. I also managed to snow ski all around the country. I got a job at a, a thing called Ski View where I skied every weekend for 10 weeks a year and got paid for it. I did stand-up comedy at ski resorts. And that turned into me hosting the original X Games for ESPN. Now, if that's not kind of a James Bondish life, I don't know what is. And so that's part of my idea now that you dream. I mean, I have now worked with major celebrities. I've hosted national talk shows. I own a TV studio. I'm in love with a very exotic, amazing man. And I have the two kids that I desperately wanted, but didn't have until I was 42. Um, and, 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 and I, here, I've got a picture right here. Um, and I've spoken on stage in front of 10,000 people. How do I, oh, look, actually there's a picture of Joshua. Wait a second. Oh, look. All right. So check this out. I didn't know this on my desk. There's a picture of my man. And here's a picture of me starring in a television series with my man. And you're like, how did you get all that? I'm going to tell you something. I'm not related to anybody. I've never slept with the right people or the wrong people. I just wanted it. And I teach that now because part of getting what you want is knowing what you want, knowing why you want it. So Ari, you started a podcast. I'm sure there's a real reason behind the why you created a podcast called Create a New Tomorrow. And we'll get in that in a second. So knowing what you want, why you want it, and then giving yourself permission to just freaking go for it. That is, uh, that's pretty awesome. You know, I, I've been lucky enough to be around you in different ways for many, many, many years. Um, I had the pleasure of working on some, some injured shoulders and getting your spin gym, you know, that was part of, uh, part of my what? process. What? Oh, wait, did you just mention my national fitness product that I've sold 2 million of? I did. I did. I did mention that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the thing about you and the thing that, that I love, I think, most is that you know how to bring people on board with whatever it is that you want to do. And that is a skill that so many people would love to have, that skill of being able to pitch something, an idea, a thought, a dream, and have the masses come on board with that thought and that dream of yours, right? So you create movements. And so I, I really am I'm fascinated by the idea of creating a movement and having that movement. You know, create a new tomorrow is all about how do we create movements that move the world forward and stop the lack of progress in ourselves and in our society, right? So how do we stop the bullies is, that's, that's my biggest thing is, to me, all of the system as it is, is a bunch of bullies and a bully's best friend is the silence of others. And if you wanna bring people on board, you gotta be loud about it. And that's something, you know, creating those movements and being loud about your your thoughts is something that you have absolutely um, mastered. So let's talk a Well, thank you. You know, the, the thought of pitching, and this is where people seem to get confused. So pitching is not selling. When you, in, in fact, I call it the three E's. You excite someone, you engage them, and then you enroll them into what you're doing. You're not selling anything. Now, it doesn't mean you can't make money and, and get yeses from a pitch, but that's not really the point of it. And so, so often people talk at people or they just talk. If you ask somebody what they do, they'll go, I do this or I do so many things or whatever they say. They're not communicating. 
So as I'm talking to you, I'm listening to my, my inner soul that's saying there's a lot of people listening to this as well who want to up-level their lives, who are passionate about people that you bring on. So I'm going to speak into their hearts. And that's the intention of why I'm talking. I don't need to just tell my story. I know my story. And that's the problem is people don't realize who they're talking to or why they're talking. And the second thing you really, really need to think about is if you've got a product, a service, an idea that you want to communicate to other people, you don't want to tell them that they need it. Well, you need to get fit. Well, okay, thank you very much. Because people don't buy. By the way, people love to buy things. They just hate to be sold. So people are not going to buy what you think they need. They will only buy. And you've only bought what you want to buy. Think about it. So then my job is not to tell you what you need, but to enroll you and go, hmm, so Ari, if you've got a shoulder pain and you've tried other little therapies, let me tell you something, this thing rotates at 200,000, literally RPM, it just vibrates through your whole body. It's portable and sits at your desk where you are in a Zoom call most of the day. If this did any of those things, would this be a good idea for you? Oh, absolutely. Bingo, now you want it. That's all I had to do is to create the want in your head. And that's a very different skill set. And I've been doing this professionally my entire life. I didn't actually have any idea what I was doing when I auditioned for Body by Jake's Fit TV in the early 1990s. And there was a pen on the desk. It was a sign that said, look at the camera, sell me the pen. Now, I'm not a salesperson. I don't like to sell. I, I don't even, I mean, I hate to be sold. So I looked at the camera and I said, you know, it's a funny thing about pens. But I got to college. I was really young. I was 16 years old. And my mom used to write me longhand notes every day. And I, in a, with a purple pen, actually. And I kept the entire stacks like two and a half inches thick because it meant to me that this little thing, this little pen could reach out and touch somebody's heart. Well, Body, uh, Body by Jake came out, grabbed my face, and you're going to make me a lot of money. And what happened from that for the next five years is I wrote the pitch for every fitness, health, and wellness product that came out. And you go to YouTube and see this. It's pretty extraordinary when I look at it. 1,500 different products we sold the network to Fox for $500 million. That turned into my infomercial career. To date, I've hosted 189. On Monday, I will shoot my 190th infomercial. So this concept of pitching, I intuitively know. I really do. And I've known it all along. I don't know how to clean or bake or drive race cars, but I can pitch. And then it, I took that into home shopping. For 28 years, I've been on home shopping. You have to, you have to actually pitch and sell Two to five thousand dollars a minute every minute that you're on home shopping. Twenty-eight consecutive years I've been doing that, and then I realized somebody said to me, "Can you teach what you do?" My first instinct was, "No, I'm just so special." And then I thought, "Well, you know, I actually do the same thing over and over again. I think I, I think about what the audience is. I think about where they're sitting. I think about kind of a tennis game about how you volley back and forth, and then you slam that point and you go on to the next person." Remember, I've never seen their faces because they're on a TV camera. Well, I've now taken that over the last three months and now done that online on Zoom calls where I can see everybody's faces. And now I teach pitch at an amazing speed. Every Sunday, we have a two-hour masterclass that I've been doing for 12 weeks. And then I take people through a process. I have created a movement. We call it OPP, Other People's Platforms. And how you can take whatever you do and market it and get it known just like I'm doing on your podcast. I don't own your, I didn't do your podcast. I don't own your audience, but if I'm exciting enough to them, they're going to want to follow me. And that's how you leverage other people's platforms. It's what I've done my whole life. And it's a very exciting movement. So people are now getting their pitch, their free gift together, their funnels together. And we're teaching them how to do all of those things so that during this time, you're not suffering. So many people are committed to having a mom and pop store or they have to have a business where they see people face to face. That's a great idea, but all of you have something that you can enroll somebody to online. And the cool thing is I've got two 17 year old kids right now. Not so cool. They're sitting at home doing homeschool going, mom, what happened to my senior year? And think about it. They are being deprived of that. They don't get the prom. They don't get the football games. They don't get all the things that we all grew up with. And it's very disconcerting. And so my daughter said to me, she said, mom, she's been doing funnels for five years. She's very successful in her own right. She'll charge $5,000 to a customer. She hasn't graduated high school yet. And she said to me, mom, you're not, you're not traveling like you always do. I normally travel like 200 days a year to speak around the world and shoot TV shows. And I'm sitting here in my, my home office. And she said, what if I worked on a business with you and for you to help others get the pitch thing down? 
12 weeks. In the first week we opened this business, we grossed $25,000. She's 17. In the first month, she grossed 100000 I got to tell you, we got some. The biggest problem now is I don't think she's going to go to college. She can't afford to go to college. She's making too much money. I don't think you could afford for her to go to college. <laughs> oh, well, that's true. Actually, it's funny. There's an I, I set aside the five, the five twenty nine, whatever it is. She's got the money, but I can't afford to have her go either. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, college these days is such a an interesting thing. You know, we're homeschooling my six year old, and um, I just don't see the schools being like the schools were when, when you and I were young. They they don't teach as much, and they definitely don't have the kind of training that's for the modern world. They're, they're still back 50, 60 plus years ago as far as what they're learning. But I'll give you a, a, just a little quick story. My, my six-year-old was on the homeschool computer class. And this was like the week that we decided to take him out of that school completely. But so the, the teacher asks how everybody's feeling about this new format of doing Zoom classes. And my six-year-old son says, I'm angry. And the teacher says, well, why are you angry? And he says, I have five businesses and nothing you're teaching me is going to help me with any of them. <laughs> wow. What does your son do? Oh, he's got a ninja family club. He just started his, uh, his YouTube channel. He's, uh, he makes jewelry out of paper clips and, you know, <laughs> and ne wow. like necklaces and bracelets out of paper clips, yep. uh, sells his old toys. That's a business for him. And, and I think wow. a lemonade stand too. So, well, apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Well, yeah. you know, we had the same conversation because as entrepreneurs and you and I are, we're raising a little entrepreneur children uh, a couple, two years ago. So my daughter was in class and we both parents had to get called in because it was like a computer class. And one, she was learning how to make a resume. And the teacher was like, you need to do this because when you get hired, you're going to need to do this. And McKenna said, I'm not working for anybody. She said, oh, no, 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 you need to. And finally, we had to get called in because it got to a kind of a, a heated moment. And the teacher said, look, your daughter's being a little disruptive. We're doing resumes so that when she wants to work, she wants to go out in the workforce, she can get hired. And she's telling us she's not working for anyone. And I said, well, she's 100% right. In fact, if she does it right, you'll work for her. And the teacher was like, excuse me? I said, my daughter makes $5,000 a month right now and she's 12. Do you make 60 grand a year? And she looked at me like, I don't even know what you're talking about. I said, well, that's too bad because that is the new world. And so you're 100% right. Six years old, that's frightening to though. That's actually exciting as all get out. Yeah, you know, her, wow. her best friend or his, his best friend is uh, Neva Lee Rekla. And I don't know if you've heard of, uh, of the Reklas, but they have a podcast and, and a book and it's called the Superpower Experts, and so her podcast is Superpower Kids. Mm -hmm. I think I met her at Secret Knock. You you might have because she's definitely been there. She she's she's been mentored by Bernie Dorman uh, <coughs> in CEO space. I mean forever. Yeah. So I know Bob knows her. She she's been on stage on Inc. She's been considered to be uh, I think Inc.'s one of Inc.'s uh, most um, influential kids in America. And so that's his best friend. So Bernie at, at three years old says to, to my son, Gabriel, he says, you know, Neva's, you know, just going to pass you by. You've got to get your business going. <laughs> oh, a little challenge. I like that. So he challenged them and then they worked all day on, on a pitch for his business. And, uh, and they ended up creating his business and his business was I want to help people be happier. And so he does these pictures for the refrigerator that makes people happy. And I love that. McKenna did a, she did a boat. She did a GoFundMe uh, called McKenna Riley's boat.com. She said, mom, I want a boat. I'm like, you're 14. She said, well, no, but I want the boat to take disadvantaged kids out. Cause I get to go out on the water with dad's boat. And I think I can do this. I got my boater's license and she great. She raised $10,000. Like it was nothing. And we've got adults who can't figure any of this out. Maybe well, because they went to school. <laughs> I think I think that's the that's the the breakdown is the the school teaches you how to get a job and those jobs that used to be a 40 year job and you get a gold watch at the end don't it really exist too much anymore and so we're 
we're in. But the- even the whole concept of how we teach. So McKenna said to me recently, said, mom, I'm getting really tired of this. I go out with my friends and adults look at us like, oh, you kids think you know everything. And she said, mom, you give me a cell phone in 20 minutes and I do know everything. Anything you want to know, it's right here. And I thought without being, you know, annoying, she's right. You want to know who crossed the Potomac, you know, what river Washington across? Bam. It tells you. You want to do math. It, you know, you're walking around with a calculator that is faster than what they used to go to the moon with and an entire room full of computers in your hand at all times. It's not like this is going away anytime soon. And so if that's true, schools really do need to change their game. And uh, it's a little confusing. It's happening way faster than the system can handle. And so how ironic that the system broke down, that kids are being homeschooled and that school itself has now fallen apart. So maybe it all is supposed to happen this way. I don't really know. Yeah. You know, the thing is, though, the systems in general, in my world, I look at the medical system, I look at the healthcare system, I look at uh, the agricultural system, and none of them have moved at the speed of technology. None of them have been shifted or changed or progressed as fast as technology has progressed. So for instance, we have all this uh, ability to do hydroponic growing of our food. But in the communities where it's needed most, where is it? Hmm, that's an interesting point. Where is it? It's not, it's not in Africa. It's not in Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> you know, I mean, we have the ability to create these amazing buildings that are gardens and that will feed the entire city. <laughs> but where are they? They're in other countries. I got it. They're not here. Hey, so- Systems are, are kind of breaking down. And in your world, you know, you've been a pioneer. So what, what would you say to people who are creating new inventions that want to have those things sold and, and out in the world and mass produced and mass consumed? What would you say to those people? Have a plan have a structure, have a mentor, and then go for it. Uh, Too many times people will tell me their idea that they've been sitting around thinking about for the last 10 years. Like, well, that's too bad because your your son and my daughter have Zoomed past them. Um, I'm afraid someone will steal it. Well, then just get it out fast. You make it a great name because you don't even need a patent. Let me tell you something. If you've got a product and someone wants to take, rip it off, odds are they've got more money than you do and you're going to spend all your time legally fighting them. There's no point to that. The system is not designed for you. If you really think it's such a great thing, license it to somebody else and don't have it be your only idea. That's one of the big things that people go, oh, you know, if someone takes that, yeah, they're liable to. That's kind of how the world works. That is how a lot of it works. Uh, and if that crushes you, then don't get in the game at all. Uh, but fear is a big thing. So I actually have a new book coming out on October 16th. Very excited about this. And this is a fascinating story behind the book. So it's called One Habit for Entrepreneurial Success. There's a gentleman out there who created a One Habit series of books. And he and I met on a phone call eight weeks ago. Wait a second, Forbes. You have a book that's in somebody's hands on Amazon and a number one bestseller in eight weeks? Yeah, this one surprises even me because my last two books each took three years to get out. Not doing that anymore. So I meet him in kind of a, he was prospecting, which means that you're out there on LinkedIn and you're trying to make connections and you're figuring it out. And then when you meet somebody, what's your pitch? Because you can probably get to almost anybody. Most of you, when you finally get to me, you just can't pitch me. But I have the bad, 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 and I'll just hang up on you. I just don't have the time for pitch that's not well organized because that means I can't invest in you and your company. There's some basics that you need to know. And by the way, if you come to me through my classes, odds are I will help you, hint, hint. Um, and by the way, if any of this is interesting to you, go to www.forbes360.com. All my information is there, how to find me on social media, how to find some of the free gifts I've got for you guys. It's all, it all lives right there. And so he gets me on the phone. And he tells me what he's up to. And I looked at his website and thought, you know, this is interesting. And he does these compilation books of like 50 authors. And it was a reasonable price for authors to get involved. And I said to him, I said, how long does it take for most books, you know, a co-author to get their authors? He said, about three to six months. I said, great. I'm going to do it in 24 hours. He said, excuse me? I said, yeah. I said, I've got a whole tribe of students who are on it, who I've trained to take massive action. I'm going to pitch it tomorrow and I'll have all 50 authors in 24 hours. Watch me. Well, he got so excited that he goes home and he sends me a book cover 
And the first book cover he sends over, I don't like. It's of a, of a man. And I thought, you know, I now know my branding. I'm much more feminine than that. Can't have a guy on the cover. Sorry. The next one he sends over is a, of a woman, but she's got like a sweatshirt on. I'm like, now that looks like the Unabomber. Then he says to me, how about uh, put you on the cover? I said, no, no, the book's not about me. The book is about habits for entrepreneurial success. This is also about understanding your ego and your place and all this. About four hours later, it's now the middle of the night. And he comes to me with a, a light bulb on a chalkboard, which happens to be two of my favorite things in life. The light bulb represents Edison and ideas. And the chalkboard is something I've always had a passion for. And I thought, man, you just nailed it. So I get a book cover in about four hours. Next morning, I put this out to my friends and my team members. Bam, everybody signs up. We've got 50. He just, Steve is on the phone going, um, no one's ever done this before. I said, great, well, hold tight because now I'm going to go get 50 celebrities. I'm going to get amazing people that we all know. So I got the guy, uh, Kevin Sorbo, who played Hercules, the guy who created Make-A-Wish Foundation, who's granted 450,000 wishes, the man who created the Ugg boots that we all wear, the man who created Pictionary, uh, a whole bunch of other celebrities. I've got Chuck Liddell as an MMA fighter and a, and a TV star. Paul Logan's a movie star. I got uh, Marla Gibbs is a five-time Emmy Award winning actress from 227. I got a whole bunch of my celebrity friends from all walks of life all talking about their one habit for success. I got Kerry Gordy, Motown's son. I mean, his dad created Motown. They're all in this book. And the entire book, everyone's got about three pages. It's your one habit that you would wish on other people and then and that's make you successful. And then an unhabit that you'd like people to get rid of. It's 820 pages long. It's a massive book. It's now the largest entrepreneurial success book for habits ever produced. And it launches uh, on the 16th. And I recommend that everybody get one. I'll tell you why. It would be today. Because, yeah, well, it is. If your show is airing today, but if your show is going to air for a long time, you want to go to One Habit for Entrepreneurial Success on Amazon. And you don't read the whole book. You just crack it open. It takes about five minutes. You read a habit and you go, huh, if I incorporated that one habit, how would my life be better? And I will tell you, that's how I built my life. Uh, a couple of fantastic habits that are not in the book for me is one, I learned this from one of my ex-partners who was a fundraiser for major politicians. And he'd be on the phone all day. I'm like, who are you talking to? He's like, well, here's my habit. You call people when you don't need them. So they're there when you do. Oh, too many times you call your friends. Well, hey, I need help. Dude, why didn't you call me on my birthday or say hi at the holidays? Oh, well, I didn't want to buy. call people when you don't need them. Ask how they're doing. Do a little word of encouragement, at least on Facebook, reach out to them and touch your friends, touch your database. They're living, breathing people. And odds are you will need something. I want people to come buy the book. So now I get to reach out to my friends and they're not surprised. And it's not like, oh, you only, you only reach out when you want something. Another habit is I like pitching all the time. I just pitched you my book. Now I'm, I'm pitching all the time. I'm always enrolling people into a class, into a new idea, into the fact they could get fitter with spin gym. That's what I call pitching. So, you know, you pitch me already to be on your, on your podcast. And I said, yes. Why do we do that with each other? Because this is how we communicate and uplift each other. And if we all have fun ideas, we want to communicate. You're always enrolling people. If you're smart, otherwise you're boring. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I've never been accused of being boring. No, I don't think so. So I'm excited. What's one of your favorite habits? So one of my favorite habits is I go into the sauna in the morning when I wake up and I meditate for a little while and listen while I'm meditating, I listen to uh, Jim Rohn. <laughs> Love that. Right. So I am continually programming my brain with positive messaging and things like that. And, you know, one of the things that I have from Jim Rohn in my head that just won't go away is don't wish it were easy. Wish you were better. Oh my, oh my God. I was just literally thinking of that quote. That's I actually just wrote that yesterday in one of the books I'm working on. Say it again so everybody can hear it. Don't wish it were easy. Wish you were better. Yep. That and is a great, great quote. That is one of my favorite quotes. So I listen to a lot of those kinds of things. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a creature too much of habits. I don't like addictions of any kind, whether they're habitual and positive or habitual and negative. So um, I've learned how to have kind of habits that don't equal 
doing something a certain amount of times per week, right? Or a certain amount of times. But what I do is I assess. So I have a habit of assessing and reassessing and assessing and reassessing, which I love it. I learned how to do when I started working with Olympic athletes, because if I didn't assess where they were at and then reassess after a few weeks, a six weeks, a 10 weeks, you're right. Then I wasn't sure about the results that we were getting. And so I wanted to make sure that they were sure. And I wanted to make sure I was sure that the results we were getting were quantifiable. And so I try to make things as quantifiable as I possibly can by assessing and reassessing and saying, okay, that didn't work. What is going to work? This is working good, but it's not optimal. What will make it work better? And so I just continually have this questioning in my brain. And I think questions are really the habit that I've gotten into in general a lot in my life is I'm always curious as to the nature of people and to how they live. And I want to understand people. And it's funny, I just read a book with my son because I'm reading him the books that I read when I was a kid, which are these value books. They're called the value books. And each one is a value and a historical character that exemplified that value. So this last one was understanding. And it was- So what is that that called? Is it a series called the value books? Yeah, the value books. I've never heard of them. That's actually a great idea for my classes. Yeah, I- I, have a copy actually downstairs. I'll show you a copy in a second, but okay. um, they, the book, so the one I just did was understanding the value of understanding. And it was all about Margaret Mead. And ah, I love it. Who doesn't know who Margaret Mead is. She was an anthropologist who was very curious about people and started writing books. She went and lived with tribes in different, uh, like the Samoas and different. Yes, she did. And, and so on. And she would learn about people. And in this day and age, especially with all of the protests and crap that's going on, wouldn't it be awesome if instead of judging, we were more curious about understanding? Oh, well, don't even get me started about that. Oh yeah. This this is my kind of, this is the stuff I I love to, to have these discussions you know, all of that, what's going on in the world has an explanation. And the only thing that we are missing is the proper questions. How do we ask them? And then how do we listen with an open heart versus a judgmental heart? Mm -hmm. And that was the lesson of Margaret Mead. That was, that was what she exemplified. And that's been something that I've striven for, my entire life is to understand people because like you, like I was bullied. I was treated very poorly in my childhood. Not a very, I wouldn't recommend my childhood on anybody because (laughs) of the kinds of things I had to go through. And well now, but now I'm going to share Wait, I'm going to stop you right there for a second. I do a training, a two day training every month called breakthrough. I only take 12 people through it at a time. What you just said, I'm going to turn around for you. While your childhood may have been frustrating and bad and you wish it would have been different, you wouldn't be who you are, which I think is pretty extraordinary and how you're raising your son. And so then you've got to go back. And what I would reframe in your brain, honestly, and I would take a moment to reframe it, is that you've got to thank your childhood and thank your bullies and thank all the crappy things and find a place in your heart. See, so many people do exactly what you just said. They're like, everything was wonderful, but that was horrible. No, actually... That was what got you here. And I have people literally turn around and thank all the crappy people in their life from a very, very, what I do is not, you can't teach this thing. You have to go through this experience because it shifts your internal barometer. It shifts the, the acid in your stomach because you're no longer in the back of your mind still going, oh, screw that bully. You in fact fall in love with the people who hurt you most because they're actually not real anyway. But in your brain, they're still in the negative side. And we get to push them over to the where you love them side. Wow. I mean, I've had people, honestly, I know this sounds crazy, but tell the person who killed her brother that she loves him. I know that sounds bizarre, 
but in the whole scheme of making you a healthy, happy human being, getting you disease free, which is dis ease, you go, I love my childhood because I love who I am right now. And that changes everything. Yeah. And, and what I was saying is I don't wish my childhood on anybody else, but I think it was exactly meant for me. That was the, the caveat was I believe that I was uniquely put in those positions because of how I could handle them. Like that saying, God doesn't give you anything that you can't handle. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that what I could handle is what somebody else could handle. Just like what somebody else is handling is something that I could handle. It's those experiences were uniquely designed to make me who I am. I have a phrase that says you are the sum of the obstacles you overcome. And I can't change anything in my past because everything, including all the bad things. And there's some pretty bad things. I raised a little boy from South Central who was murdered. Uh, that was pretty tragic to go through. Joshua and I are eyewitnesses to the Las Vegas shooting. Everything that you see on the overhead footage was on my iPhone. Yeah, I mean, lying in the hospital with a kidney stone, very, very, very close to death. You can't change any of those things because I now talk about what I do. You know, and it's funny, when we talk about pitching. If you are listening to this amazing conversation, congratulations. But one of the things is when you want to take action in your own life, one of my students and typically students will come to me, they'll say things like when I say, what do you do? Oh, I'm, a, I'm an author, speaker, entrepreneur. Well, that actually doesn't say anything. I don't know what you're an author about, what you speak about, and why. they're all very generic words. But people use them all the time. And so one of my girls says, well, I really want to speak and empower women. I'm like, that's nice. That's your pitch. Yeah. I, why do you do it? Because I love it. I'm like, you hear the genericism of this? It sounds like everybody else. You know what she says today? Her name is Teresa. And she will say, Forbes, I speak on stages to empower women because when I was little, I was repeatedly raped by my older brother and my mom wouldn't listen. The school didn't listen. And it was a house of horrors. And because I've overcome that and through my life, I now am, it's a mission of mine to give women who do not have a voice, a voice so they don't squish it down for the rest of their lives. That's a pitch that will get her on stages that will get her talks and podcasts. And all she did was reveal a little bit about, Give herself the credibility. And I'll tell you what, it's a nonstop pitch. And you go, well, that's a pitch. I'm like, that's what we teach. That is an amazing ability. And, uh, and I highly recommend anybody who's listening to this show right now, you know, go check out Forbes. And it's what, Forbes360.com? Mm -hmm. And every Sunday, every Sunday I teach it. Now watch, I'm going to do something with you for a second. So when I ask you what you do, what do you say? I'm a sports and injury rehab therapist. Okay. That's nice for you. Can, would it be okay if we kind of tweak that a little bit? Sure. All right. So why do you do what you do? Because as an athlete growing up, I was continually getting injured. I uh, found out I had a brain tumor. And at 18, I was dead for 26 minutes. So I ended up waking up in the hospital three days later saying, I think I need to become a healer. Okay. So I had to ask you that question. Here would be my interpretation of how you pitch when someone says, what do you do? I would actually say, as somebody who grew up as a very frustrating, uh, frustrated athlete, never got to the pinnacle, had a brain tumor, was actually dead at one point because of this. And when I woke up, I became set on a mission to help other athletes achieve their greatness. So Forbes, I am a sports and da 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 It takes another minute. It's not too long. But if you said that, oh, we would go, oh, Wow. So the, the technique here is to incorporate a little bit of why you do what you do and not just answer the question. It's a very different, you watch the reaction of people when you say that. So what do you do? And you tell that little story, they'll be like, they'll just fall in love with you. They can't help it. As opposed to you going, I'm a, I'm a sports athlete. Well, who cares? It's about the eye. Right. So that's one of my many techniques is to give people a little bit of a bit more information than they technically asked for. The other way you can handle it is to tell people what you can do for them. See, Ari, if I asked you about that, I don't need your, your skill. So the conversation kind of ends there and we have to go, oh, and how's the weather, right? But what if I asked you a question of, hey, Ari, what can you do for me? What would you say? I would ask you a question back. What, what is it that you would like to have? Nope, 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 nope. You don't get to ask a question. That's, that's not the right way to play this game. 
Okay. So I'm going to ask you what, and because you never actually hear this question anyway, but what can you do for me? Think about it for a second. Make some assumptions. Okay. I'll make an assumption. Okay. I, can, I can make you perform better than you ever thought you could. In what, in what arena? Physi physically, as an athlete. Okay, but I'm not an athlete. Even if it's walking out of your, getting out you, of your, so now, I'm, I'm, this is. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay. Well, that, that's, that's an interesting. Okay. So do you also teach mindset for athletes? Absolutely. All right. So here's what I would say. Ask me what you could do for me. What can you do for me? You know, Forbes, I know that you're a top performer in your field, but every once in a while, I'll bet that you get frustrated or unmotivated, even at your level. Well, I'm someone who trains top athletes. And while you're fine physically, what if I help give you a superstar mentality? Would that be of interest to you? Right? So, so that's where the assumptions, yeah. So you don't ever need to ask somebody. I can assume exactly what you need based on what the vibes that you get. And that's the skill I teach people. Because, and it's called the assumption. Whenever you meet someone, you can pretty much assume how you might be able to help them given what you do or not. But most people are not even thinking about the other person when they say, what do you do? Because the point is when someone asks you, what, what do you do? It's a social platitude. They don't care really what you do unless they really care about what can you do for them. Then they're invested, then they're interested. And I'll tell you, it's been an interesting observation. I have hundreds of students. And just recently I got two students, one who does this thing called nameology and the other who does handwriting analysis. And they're probably the most successful new students because everybody wants to know, ooh, Look at my name. What is I, what is the first letter A mean in my name? If I have an, it's all about me, and it proved my point. They want to know all about them. And so, when you're talking to somebody, you should always have that in the back of your mind. And this is why, along with my daughter, one of the things that we do is to encourage everybody to have, especially in the online environment, some small course. I don't care if it's a ten dollar course about what you do that everybody could benefit from. So Ari, most people are not going to be Olympic athletes or even athletes at all, but the mentality required, maybe the top 10 things that every entrepreneur needs that I learned from training high performance athletes. So when you're talking to somebody and say, oh, you know, Forbes, yeah, I train high performance athletes. If you know any, certainly reach out to me. But I got to tell you, this little video training that I've got, this helps everybody. It's like, oh. And so now you've made a transaction, an interaction. And I think that's how people can best serve the world and each other. Awesome. Yeah, I've been creating a, um, a mastermind that I'm calling Create a New Tomorrow Mastermind. <laughs> there you go. And, and it's being, I'm designing it the same way that I train Olympic athletes, but it's for entrepreneurs and activists, people who want to change the world and want to make money while doing it and create movements. But it's, it's designed the same way that I have taken a, an injured athlete from an injury to a gold medal or a world championship. So That's perfect. That is exactly what you need because a lot of us need to benefit from some of the skills that you know and the techniques that you know that have nothing to do with actually being an athlete. Right, absolutely. So yeah, I just had to think about it a little bit differently. Which is That's what, what I do for people. I get you to think differently. I get you to realize you have much more earning potential than you ever imagined. I get you to stop being un, you know, not confident. Forbes, how do I get confidence? Well, let me check my Wizard of Oz book. Bullshit. You know what? You've got the confidence. Somebody squished it in you a long time ago. So I get to uncover people's confidence, a sense of freedom that they can accomplish anything. And then I have tribes of people. I'm going to invite you and everyone else to come to my Forbes Riley inner circle. It's a Facebook group. It's totally free the most interactive, supportive group you've ever seen. We have all one goal and that's to lift each other up. Any posts that we make, you're gonna get 30 to 40 comments. You're gonna get people wanting to know more about you. And then we train people. And we just launched something last night I'm very excited about. So my daughter who's 17 has a different sense of accountability than you and I do, Ari. You know why? Because we're not in school. Because nobody says we have to get A's on our tests. And if we get an F, how bad we feel and have to show mom the report card. So the accountability factor as an adult is pretty much non-existent, especially if you're an entrepreneur or solopreneur. You, even forget entrepreneur. January 1st, I'm going to lose 20 pounds. Make that declaration. Make right. January 15th, you gain 10 pounds. Who cares? Who cares? Hey, you know, it didn't work. But what if you were part of a group? 
that every four weeks you make a declaration and you write out the action plan. We give you that. Everybody checks in with each other every Thursday night and we hold each other accountable to whatever it is you said that you want to do. At the end of the month, we have a pool of money and everybody, you get in a lottery if you achieve your goal. And so you get money for reaching your goal or you get demoted in our ladder system for not reaching your goal. And so we've just launched this. It was so much fun to launch this last night because everyone's like, oh my God, this is what I need. I'm like, I know that's what you need. You can take all the classes you want in the world and learn all the stuff and everyone's out there teaching class. But what you need now is you need a group of people who are super supportive, all different areas of expertise so that you can say, hey, I'm hit an obstacle. I need help with this in technology. I need help with this in shipping or manufacturing. Can you help me? And that is now an evolution. I'm very, very excited to be, to really create this community of people who are only looking out for each other. That is, that is awesome. So at the end of every call, I ask every single guest three things that are actionable tomorrow that somebody can take that's listening to this. And you've already given about a thousand of them, but I want to just condense it at the end to three things that somebody can do literally as soon as they listen to this to change their world and create a new tomorrow today. So number one, go get a book, a blank book. That becomes your journal. That becomes your mind on paper. And there's a couple of things you're going to do with it. Every morning, wake up and just brain dump. Literally two or three pages of just get stuff out of your head so you can start your day with a clear path. In that book, write down, and you can write it down every day. What do you want? What do you want today? What do you want overall? What do you want? And begin to articulate what you want, because as soon as you can start to see it and dream it, and I'll tell you what, in my trainings, we take that to the nth degree. We have a, what do you want? Deep dive exercise. Why do you want it? And then we have vision boards, because in my experience of getting things that I wanted, you can manifest almost anything. And Ari, I'll tell you what, I call it, what have you Forbes lately? So to Forbes something is not necessarily just to manifest it, but to manifest it, especially when people say, oh, you can't get that. Who do you think you are? And you get to write down all the things that you've manifested. And just like you, if you look around your house, you've manifested all kinds of things, but you didn't even realize it or give yourself credit for it. So this book becomes something that's very important. And maybe when you go to sleep at night, you write, hey, I accomplished this. I'm proud of myself. Or here's what my plan is for tomorrow. So that book, and I have a lot of them lying around, but you know, my little journal book that I use, that's number one. Number two, I would tomorrow, and I have to brag here, I would sign up for my pitch class on Sunday. It's $19. On Sunday at five o'clock for two hours, I teach a master class on just what Ari and I have been doing. The difference is how I played with Ari. I do that with everybody in the Zoom class. I keep them very small. And for two hours and $19, you get to go, wow, I never thought about that way about my business. This is exciting. And so I think that's fascinating. And number three, I would get one of these. Now, why would I do that? Well, Ari has one, I have one, and so do 2.2 million people. Most of us are sitting behind a desk almost all day. And I will tell you, the most important thing about this is not necessarily fat loss, although that's cool. I mean, my arms are tight and toned and so are my abs. You're like, this works that fast? I'm like, yeah, five minutes a day, you tell me this. But your heart health. Too many of us are now stuck inside, not being healthy. And when you can elevate your heart rate this fast, this easy, I'm literally doing it while I'm on a call, you put it down. If there was a better product, I would be showing that to you. But I think the spin gym is honestly the most amazing thing I've ever created. Almost that anyone's ever created. It's not a resistance band. It's not a dumbbell. Mary Colazzo, who used to work in my office, she had two hip replacements. She was always very overweight. Ari, she lost 168 pounds. That took her a year and a half. I have her before and after picture and you're just going, she's 70 years old. So number one, it's never too late. Number two, it's very, very affordable. And number three, it's five minutes. Literally just love yourself that much that you write down what you want. You surround yourself with people who are up leveling each other. And number three, you take care of you. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for being here. This was a great conversation. I literally could spend another two hours having this conversation and getting down into the nitty gritty dirtiness of, of uh, you and of the world in general of that, you, that we've been in. And, uh, and so I, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on. I know how busy you are. 
I know. Well, I got a challenge for you. Hang on a second. All right. So I think we should do another one of these with two more boxes, your son and my daughter. We could do that. <clears throat> yeah. I think that would be a worthwhile, exciting conversation for everyone to hear because our kids think differently even than we do, but certainly almost everyone else I've ever met. Yeah. Absolutely. We can, we can definitely schedule that. So thank you so much for being here and, uh, and I appreciate you and have always appreciated our friendship. And so, you know, people, you really, really want what Forbes has to offer. What she says speaks to the soul of what you need. And if you want to move your world forward, your personal world forward, just having the pitch fest for $19, I'm talking about the breakthrough that happens in your soul when you figure out how to, how to communicate what it is that you do and what you want. I mean, that alone is much more valuable than anything we could, uh, we could ever give you. So anyway, this has been another episode of Create a New Tomorrow. Thank you so much for being here. I'm your host, Ari Gronich. And, you know, let's create a new tomorrow today. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for listening to this podcast. I appreciate all you do to create a new tomorrow for yourself and those around you. If you'd like to take this information further and are interested in joining a community of like-minded people who are all passionate about activating their vision for a better world, go to the website, createanewtomorrow.com and find out how you can be part of making a bigger difference. I have a gift for you just for checking it out and look forward to seeing you take the leap and joining our private paid mastermind community. Until then, see you on the next episode.